Thanks for joining us here today for the Water, Water Everywhere, the Paradox of the 21st Century. I'm Gary White, uh, CEO and co-founder of Water.org, and I'll be moderating today. And uh, on the panel, we have uh, up here Greg Allgood, uh, we have uh, Luis Montoya, and we have Phil Balcon and Sylvia Lee. And uh, I just wanted to frame things up a little bit before, before we get started, and we will be going into to questions pretty directly without a lot of preamble. And then there will also be time uh, in the second half for questions from, from the audience. So uh, clearly, you know, water scarcity is something that has been confronting us. It becomes, it's been much more in the news over the last uh, few years and the last decade. And uh, there's, there's clearly this global crisis that's facing us. And it's oftentimes referred to as a global crisis, even though it's really a series of local crises that we're, we're facing. So in the session, we're going to examine not only how social entrepreneurs, but private citizens, large multinationals, and others are really addressing water quality and security around the globe. And there are really a lot of dimensions to water. And of course, we can't hope to, to get to everything today. But just some of the dimensions uh, that we're looking at uh, are absolute water scarcity and the fact that that right now, uh, or actually by 2030, it's projected that there's going to be a 40% gap in the global water resources relative to projected demand. And by 2025, the projections are that 1.9 billion people will be living in water scarcity, which is the most extreme uh, condition, and that's less than 1,000 cubic meters per person per year available to them. So, the scarcity issue, I think, is the thing that hits us most front and center. Uh, but as we look at this, there's all kinds of additional dimensions to this. Uh, issues around technology. You know, is technology going to be the savior for this in terms of treatment technology or whatever? And then how does that technology affect different levels of the economic pyramid? Because a lot of the technology is costly and it doesn't serve the base of the pyramid as well as other points on the pyramid. That leads us really into equity issues as well. In many developing countries right now, a lot of people in the middle class and above are getting access to water, albeit it's not 24-7, while at the same time, the poor living in slums and marginalized areas are often left completely off the grid and paying sometimes 10 times more per liter of water than people connected to the grid. So we have the equity issues built into this. The finance issues, can we look at the base of the pyramid as potential customers as opposed to recipients of charity and aid? Can we mobilize more capital that could help them? And then looking also at the policy uh, and political implications of this, the fact that, that water is not priced appropriately in developing countries and that gives us a lot of the incorrect signals in terms of water conservation, water use, the fact that agriculture takes about 70% of water use worldwide, and in emerging economies takes about 90% of the water resources. So all of these things related to policy and how we set policy going forward are going to affect us as well. And then finally, I think the concept of movement building. How do we create more of a movement around water supply scarcity, and particularly as it affects the poor in the developing world? How do we finally get to a state in the world where everybody can have access to, to safe drinking water, and can we do that in a reasonable amount of time? So if that's not enough to think about <laughs> as to teeing this up, I did want to set that broad framework, rec recognizing that there is a lot that we could dive into. But let's just start with some, some specific questions. So with you, Sylvia, uh, you know, the, the long-term and medium uh, global projections for water resources are dire, as, as I've just pointed out. What do you see as the latest trends, both positive and negative, to address the crisis, and particularly looking at it through the, the lens of the poor? Thanks. Thanks, Gary. In the last decade or so, there's been some really positive trends and some negative trends. Uh, on the positive side, um, the very first time that a Secretary of State of the United States actually made a major speech on water. Secretary Clinton did that uh, while she was Secretary of State, and that really elevated water as a security issue and really elevated it um, on top of the political agenda. 
that's been really, really positive. Obviously, on the flip side, because of the absolute water scarcity challenges that Gary mentioned, you see more and more countries um, starting to um, have conflict with each other over water resource. Obvious one, India, Pakistan, China, India, Egypt and Ethiopia, and that trend will likely to continue. So on one hand, we're getting more awareness by the political leaders. At the same time, more tensions are rising, both between countries, but also between water users. Another trend, the business community. I worked on the global risk report at the World Economic Forum about five, six years ago. There were 40 global risks that people cared about. Water was, I would say, bottom third. Really, business leaders did not really care about it. Last year, it was one of the top five global risks in terms of, they think, uh, in terms of uh, uh, importance in severity of a risk, as well as likelihood. That is a dramatic shift in five years of how the business community is viewing water as a risk. Obviously, on the flip side, water presents an amazing opportunity as well um, for businesses in terms of investments that could be um, leveraged uh, both in developed and developing countries. Um, but so far, I think the business community has, has been focused much more on some of its internal issues, you know, uh, uh, within the fence of what a company can do, but to reach out to broader communities within its watershed or within um, its communities and getting the social license to operate, that's a step that um, some companies are struggling with. You know, what is the role of private sector to engage in broader water governance issues um, in the community? And then finally, Jeff talked about this as one of the top 10 highlights of the, of the last decade, um, the fact that the Millennium Development Goals for Water has been reached. What he did mention, of course, is that the sanitation one was not reached. But if you dig deeper in that, yes, there's access to water um, it, it, that has been reached. However, we know that that well has been dug, that infrastructure has been built, but it's still, is it still working today? You know, how is that water quality, quality today? We don't really know. So yes, um, the trend is good, but if you look deeper, <laughs> there's still some unanswered questions. Yeah, and the fact that the, the water supply that is there is intermittent in many instances, and so there's really more like several billion people who still don't have access to really safe and reliable water resources. And I think the looking at the, you know, for, from my perspective, playing off that, it's like all hands on deck. You know, this is such a major global issue. We need lots of different types of solutions. We need lots of different types of investment, whether that be government, whether that be bottom, the, the, the private sector, or whether it be the users, the customer base themselves, which I think is going to have to bear a larger percentage of the cost. But if you just look at the macro issues, the World Health Organization just recently published a report that talked about the cost. If we wanted to get safe water and sanitation to everyone in the world within the next five years, it's going to cost about $200 billion a year to be invested. Well, right now, all of the external assistance combined from governments and development agencies and so forth is about $9 billion a year. So where is the rest of that money going to come from? So Phil, question to you from the private sector looking at investing in the water and sanitation space, what has you interested in this, especially given some of the background that we've seen in the past with some of the multinational corporations uh, having challenges with this, like in Cochabamba, Bolivia, for instance, where uh, you know, we saw a lot of challenges. So what, what gets you interested in this sector? Thanks, Gary. As a private investor, I've always focused on a lot in the commodity space, finite resources. And in the water area, it is no different. There is not a commodity imbalance in any other sector like we see in, the, in water around the globe today. There's just tremendous uh, demand and restrictions on supply. And you know, if you look at some of the other commodities in the world, whether it's iron ore or gold or um, copper uh, or oil or natural gas, 
there's a tremendous amount of infrastructure set up for these entities today. And I think water um, is all of a sudden exploded and people are finally realizing that, oh, by the way, this is a real critical issue. Now, granted, we, we like to think of the, the, the social and healthcare issues associated with this supply and demand imbalance. Um, but from an investment perspective, there's an opportunity here that, uh, that doesn't exist in today's um, commodity markets. And then you could take it a step further where um, you know, do you focus on desalinization? Um, do you focus on reverse osmosis? Do you focus on wells or, or some other uh, technology? And one of the things that I've been really keen on um, and many of these technologies and many of their, their fantastic solutions. But you need a water source, as, as you mentioned. You need the, either to, um, to, to filter it or to uh, cleanse that water or to desalinate the water. Um, where I've taken um, my entity and my, one of my vehicles is in um, a technology that, that essentially doesn't need a water source, um, which is really extracting humidity out of the air. Um, so there's all these different dynamics and, and, and it extracts humidity out of the air and, and generates uh, clean water. So there's all these different dynamics that you can focus on. Um, but you know, clearly the big picture is, is, and the reason why we're all here today is the supply demand imbalance and it's not getting any better. It's getting much worse. And I, I'm a big believer in, in in trying to get the private marketplace involved to help these social and health healthcare issues because it's a real trickle down effect. And you know, you, you spend time in some of these third world countries where um, they have uh, uh, phenomenal healthcare issues and it, uh, a, a lot of it goes back to the basic source of, of water. It's, you know, the kids uh, and they, d they don't have clean drinking water, and it's just a steamroll effect where if you um, get down to the basic and get down to the base, you're going to solve a whole heck of a lot of issues. So out outside of the, uh, uh, the, the commercial aspect, there's uh, also very, uh, I think it's important from my perspective that you, know, you keep in mind the social and healthcare issues. So it, there's a lot of people out there that are looking for this double bottom line investment or triple bottom line investment. And oftentimes, I don't have an answer for them when they come to us to say, you know, we, we want to be investing for social impact. There's this huge water need. But I, I can't describe to them how they can make money at it, even if it's a, if it's a small rate of return, because the market is so distorted mm -hmm. in terms of pricing and subsidies and you know, lack of maintenance of infrastructure, all these issues. Have you found a way, or do you have a hypothesis even, for how you can cut through an example where you think there is money to be made for an investor? Well, in my particular case, what we've done is we've focused on this technology that actually is a atmos atmospheric technology. Who's the customer for that? The customer is the, mun the municipalities. We have um, we've been working on this for probably six years now, and we've refined it to a point where we recently got our first order from one of the states in India that doesn't have the ability, in, where they're putting this machine, they don't have the ability to, to incorporate reverse osmosis or desalinization. So uh, it can be used as an alternative to some of these technologies, but we've been um, very focused on building these machines. But you have to, one of the negative aspects is you have to get the municipality involved. Right. And do, you, are you, do you share the risk in that? And so does your risk extend to the utility actually being able to convert this water in, into, or be able to convert paying customers to the extent that they can charge the, the tariffs that they need to recover the capital and O&M costs? No, what, what we've done is we've... Um, kind of, we're, we're building the machine and then handing it off to the muni municipality and the local municipality and how they take it, uh, that, next, that next step is, um, you know, another dynamic, which is um, one of the issues that you, you especially in, with situations like this, that you encounter when dealing with um, a, 
a product or a commodity that is in such high demand mm -hmm. in any of the uh, localities. And so you're not you're not forced to accept part of the risk of no. that. Work. Okay, interesting. No. Okay, good. Thanks. So moving on more to kind of the private sector for for both Luis and Greg, uh, you know, you guys have been really leading uh, as private sector companies focusing on water, not just water scarcity, but but uh, not water scarcity writ large, not just that, but also how it intersects with human needs, particularly at the at the base of the pyramid. And uh, you know, it's I think it's it's almost the it's almost expected now for corporations to be looking at their own water footprint and trying to drive greater efficiencies in that area. But uh, not as many companies have gone beyond that in the way that, that, that you guys have. So maybe you could each talk about what you're doing in that regard and how far you take that uh, responsibility to move beyond just the gates of the factory as you look at this. And, and also how that reflects or reinforces your social, uh, social license to operate. Can to start, Luis? Yeah. First thing that struck me is that usually people talk about the largest environmental issue to be climate change. And that has changed also. Now, you know, it's the, I think that during Water Week, they, they released some data that actually nine out of 10 people would say, you know, that water crisis was the most important crisis that we were facing on the environment. So actually, that needs mobilization of, of government, civil society, and, 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 and private, uh, private enterprises. And somehow, it's the, uh, we need to ensure, uh, 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 as a community per se, that those three engines are moving at the same speed. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, when I talk to different actors in different parts of the world, my feeling is that we're not yet moving at the same speed. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, multinational companies move at a faster speed than local companies in one sense. In other sense, you know, governments are not yet implementing policies. So somehow we need to start getting into the same right of speed and able to, to, to solve the problem. The other thing, you know, as, as just background to the problem that struck me that this morning when we were talking about the population growth and tied to other data that I was reading is that, that the issue is, is, lar is, is even going to be larger, not only in access to safe water or drinking water, but water for agricultural use. Mm -hmm. Feeding all that population growth actually is going to become a, a large, large issue, you know, and in some countries actually, and less developed countries, 70 to 90% of the water goes actually for agriculture. Mm -hmm. So th those are the things that we need to start is still looking into as we shape into solutions. As private companies, I think that the first uh, line of sight is how you do redefine your missions, your what do you want as existence, how do you tie your values with the results you want. And in, in my own corporation, we, 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 we uh, coined that with the performance with purpose. We said, you know, as a corporation, we need to deliver sustainable financial performance, but reducing our impact on the environment and, you know, and helping the communities that privilege us with the use of, the, uh, of, our, of, of our products. So in that sense, you know, we start working in, in, in two directions, but very, you know, it was something that was started to get embedded in the culture. You know, we embedded in the objectives of the executives of our corporation to look into not only reducing water or reducing energy, but also, you know, in helping the communities that, 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 that we're involved in. You know, in. In water conservation, you know, we draw a line on the sand. We said, you know, we're going to reduce by 20% our water usage by 2015. We did that already this year, so we're going for more. And actually, we developed some internal tools that assigned values to all the water streams. So actually people could analyze and say, you know, where's the cost, where are the savings, what are the parts of the process that we should focus to, to, to save more now. Saving or reducing consumption is, is not enough. A little bit tied to the license to operate is how do we help communities getting involved. And in, in, in that, you know, mainly we operate either by the uh, PepsiCo Foundation, which is our philanthropic arm, and we have been partnered with organizations like Water.org. Yeah, I should have mentioned oh. that from the outset in the interest of full disclosure, <laughs> we are a grantee of PepsiCo. Yes, so. and the uh, IDB, for example, International Development Bank, we were the first private company to participate in the Aqua Fund. So we, we broke a lot of barriers in, 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 in building the trust between the private and the public partnership, you know, and, and, and we're participating in the fund, which is managed by the bank, but at the end we'll bring more access to safe water to, to people all over the, uh, the America. So it's reduction is also, and I'll get 
probably to, in, to this later is also how do we help in best practices and agriculture mm -hmm. uh, as well. But I think that that all starts in corporation on defining who you are a little bit, what's your purpose as a corporation, and try to get that through the culture of the organization. So you are really, you know, it's not building only a, a desired objective at the top, but you're driving a, an, an army of people with a new mindset. Do you find this even more challenging as a multinational operating in these markets as opposed to local competitors, or do you think that, that what a level I, playing field? What I find sometimes is not a level playing field. You know, mm -hmm. it, uh, you, you find that some of the local competitors are not measured even by your own standards, and that's something, you know, is the, that, that hurts you. But at the end, you know, you have to be able to compete is the, by defining who you are, and you're not going to flex your internal rules just because of the... Uh, of how the, uh, the, the, the market competes, but in certain countries, we're at a disadvantage. So Greg, I mean, you've, you've been in this space for a long time, uh, and you've, you've occupied this really unique position, I think, with, within Procter & Gamble, where you're, you're really kind of the, 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 the driver behind what's almost kind of an entrepreneurial startup within P&G around really helping meet the needs of the, the base of the pyramid from a water quality standpoint. So maybe you can talk a little bit about P&G and how that evolved and, and why they were so receptive to that when you, you brought it to the, to the leadership there. Sure. And, and uh, like Lewis says, it starts by you know, reducing your uh, water footprint in your plants. And we've certainly had dramatic improvements in that. And many of our plants now are, are water neutral. But we wanted to go beyond that. And, and one of the things that's, that's my passion is, is helping address the global clean drinking water crisis. And you mentioned the water scarcity issues and, and touched a little bit on the, the um, that health of water. I think it's worth repeating that 2,000 children die every day from unsafe drinking water or sanitation hygiene. 2,000 kids die every day. That's a, a huge crisis. I mean, it's more kids dying from diarrhea than from HIV, AIDS, and malaria combined. That's still the, our reality. Um, and P&G um, developed a technology with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that we know can make an impact. It's a, it's a little water purification packet. You add it to 10 liters, you stir it up, and it literally moves the dirt, the worms, and the parasites from the water. Uh, it has iron sulfate, so it coagulates the water, and that's a very powerful tool for behavior change because people that are using it can literally see the water getting clear. And it has a disinfectant in it. It has a little bit of chlorine, like our water does, so it kills the bacteria and viruses that cause cholera, dysentery, and, and typhoid fever, and, and other diseases. We did the clinical studies with the right groups that showed it reduces diarrheal illness by about half. So you can do the math. With 2,000 kids dying every day, if we can get a lot of these packets into people's hands, we can, we can save a lot of lives. So that's what we started to do. We started to do it first as a commercial effort, where we'd provide it like we provide shampoo and washing powder, things like that. But the niche for this product happens to be those people who collect from open water sources that are rivers and ponds and streams, and those are usually pretty far remote from where, particularly at the time 10 years ago when we invented this, where we had a P&G infrastructure. So we were struggling with that, you know, and, and we invested a lot. We invested $20 million. We had a team of 30 people working in four countries to try to commercialize it. But frankly, we were losing a lot of money because when we invest to reach that far out, it just, it cost us a lot. It was about at that time I was in, in rural Kenya with some of our partners, and um, I'm sure many of you have seen this, right? It's, it's the only water source is where people dig out a pond and they, they collect surface water. It's the same water for them to drink and for the cows to drink and to poop in. And so it's highly contaminated water. So we took these packets, we cleaned this woman's water right at the side of the, of the little pond. And we're talking to her and we sort of walked away from the water while we were having a chat. And this man saw the clean water in this area where there was no clean water, and he picked, up the, he picked up her bucket and ran away. He stole the clean water. It was because it was so valuable in that area. And the woman then got down on her hands and knees and begged us for more of these packets because he didn't, she didn't want her kids to keep suffering from diarrheal illness. So that was my turning point or light bulb that said, you know, if the commercial model doesn't work, we got to find another way. We have to find another way to provide these packets. And I was there being hosted by a humanitarian organization that goes there every day. And so while P&G didn't have infrastructure, there are lots of groups that reach very poor people who have great need. And so what we decided to do, first time we've done in 175 year history, but I'm sure we'll do something like this again in 175 years, <laughs> is create a not-for-profit effort within our company. And there wasn't really a model for this, but it was a means to an end to keep providing these packets. When we had the team of 20 people investing 20 million, or uh, 20 million people investing 20 million dollars, we were able to provide a million of these packets every year. I asked for a team of two people. 
uh, and a million dollars a year initially in, um, in support. We've grown that now. Instead of a million packets a year, we're providing 120 million packets. And each provides 10 liters, so that's 1.2 billion liters of clean drinking water. And, and we're going to do more, in fact. Um, at the Clinton Global Initiative, our CEO, Bob McDonald, and President Clinton announced how we're going to scale this program up even further. It's a, a goal I thought about for a long time of what would be a sort of a legacy goal for the program. And we've passed um, several times billion liter marks. So now we've provided almost six billion liters of clean drinking water. And that's great. And we celebrate that every billion liters. But I don't know what a billion liters is. It's a lot of water. But I can't really visualize it. But I do know what one life is. And so um, we're going to scale up the program until we can save one life every hour in the developing world by providing clean drinking water. Now, that meant providing, building a whole new manufacturing plant, which is done in Singapore, but it means going into new countries and develop new partners. So, so what do you see as the end state for this, Greg? Oh, sorry. <laughs> what, do you, what do you see as the end state of this? Do you think that this is a solution that can be scaled to solve the crisis at the base of the pyramid? Or how, how do you look uh, over the horizon to, is there a state beyond this where pure packets aren't needed anymore. Um, they used to be called pure packets. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> sorry. The, the, but but uh, this is how long I've been doing it, right? Yeah, so exactly. So, but I should so, mention we, so, we changed the name. So. Uh, we we call them PNG packets PNG now, packets. Okay. which is a, a testimony to PNG's commitment to the program that we, for the first time in more than 100 years we put the name of our company on the packets. Mm -hmm. We hope that they're not needed in the future, and we hope that everybody has what everybody in this room has, and that's pipe treated water out of a pipe. That there's infrastructure. Um, but we also feel, and I feel passionately, that we shouldn't wait. While 2,000 kids are dying, we shouldn't wait until there's infrastructure for everybody. Because more than a billion, billion people have this issue, we need a whole variety of solutions. I mean, some can be purely commercial, some can be a hybrid, some can be pure philanthropy, and there's, there's not one size, one size fits all. Uh, one of the ways to illustrate your point, though, is uh, our work with World Vision in Rwanda. They have a big USAID grant to provide water infrastructure to more than a million people. They're going to be doing that over five years. They can't reach everybody all at once. So where they're not able to currently work on infrastructure, where people are drinking from literally rivers and streams, they're going to provide the, the PNG packets. And then they're going to replace that. It's a bridge strategy until they can have water infrastructure. And that's, I think I really like that model of, of, of a bridge strategy, a more short-term solution of having to, to purify your water in the home. Okay. So just opening up to everybody on the panel, maybe we can each take turns and take five minutes at this. But uh, we are at the, uh, the Skoll World Forum for Social Entrepreneurship. That implies uh, new ways of thinking. It implies innovation. And uh, I would like to get you know, each, of your, each of you to have your take on what are those innovations that are out there right now that we think can really be game changers in the space. And I know from, from our perspective, uh, what we see a lot of in terms of the game changers that are brought to us, they're around technology. So they're about that filter, they're about that UV device, they're about uh, you know, whatever type of more kind of engineering or scientific re related thing that's happening. And, and for us, we, we remain pretty technology agnostic. Uh, that those ideas are out there and some of them can really take root and work, but there's a lot that happens in the sector that isn't traced back to technology. We need different types of innovation. So one of our innovations, for instance, is water credit, where it's a financial innovation as opposed to like trying to find the silver bullet technology. And how do you use uh, microfinance to try to nudge those types of, uh, of MFIs into the water and sanitation space to serve the base of the pyramid? So that's one thing that, that we're doing. But just kind of taking, you know, the, you know, thinking wide open about innovation and what do you think holds the greatest potential uh, for innovation for water and sanitation in the coming decade? So Lee, you want to start? Yeah, no, I, I like technologies as much as the next person being an engineer, but, <laughs> um, but I think to reach um, the billions of people, but also looking at the longer term trajectory of water security and water resources challenges, I personally believe that ultimately it is a governance issue, so it's got to be an innovation around policy changes, really from the municipal level all the way to the national level and at the regional level. I, unfortunately, I cannot cite any particular mm -hmm. <laughs> success stories right now, 
Um, obviously, we're trying to explore that, but ultimately, if you want to reach every person and really have a sustainable uh, way to allocate water and making sure that there's enough water for agriculture, without the government involvement, I just don't see how that could work. I think the other, uh, we always talk about technology in terms of a sort of more supply. Um, one thing that hasn't come, and, and Lewis talked about, you know, water being 90% for agriculture in most places. We really need to think more about reducing demand. And that's not, and, and, and I would like to see more and more innovation around how either policy or technological advances around reducing demand. Now, the way most things are being structured is the more you pay, uh, you know, utilities are paid by volume of water served, right? So are there financial and policy innovations that could be done so that efficiency uh, improvements would be encouraged? And we might be able to learn from, say, the energy industry that's already been looking at that. But, but technology is certainly a very important ingredient, but uh, dealing with policy changes is absolutely necessary if we really want to reach, um, especially the base of the pyramid, but all the facets of water security. Mm -hmm. So policy, especially policy driving that kind of uh, water conservation yeah. that, that could really come at this more from the demand side yeah. versus the supply side. So, so Phil, uh, technology innovation versus innovations that might be geared more towards the financial reform of the sector, right? The fact that, that water is in this incredibly distorted market. How hard is it going to be for you to, to find technological innovations that can then have their cost recovered if, if utilities continue to price water far below their marginal cost? Well, well I think in terms of, of looking at the long-term solutions, um, a lot of it, you know, there, there's some fantastic technologies out there. You know, clearly, um, with what you guys are doing and what, what, with what you're doing, and you look at probably the, the most successful from a project finance perspective, it's desalinization, because you could build massive plants, but then you need the infrastructure, you need the, um, you know, where do you pipe it to, where do you, where do you keep it? But, you know, you asked me a question um, early on, the local level. Mm -hmm. How do you implement these technologies? There are solutions. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's really education, you know, whether it's demand reduction, but it's really implementation at the local level uh, and education at the local level. That, and, and, you know, I don't know what that solution is. Mm -hmm. But that's part of it because the private markets in the state that we're in these days, there will most likely be solutions from a supply perspective, but the implementation, and especially at the local level, um, is, I think, one of the critical aspects of solving that, solving that crisis. So, so how to convert technology and these technical solutions into water coming out of a pipe that is sustainable, that is priced right, and, and so on. And Correct, because the salute, there are solutions that are there, and I think it's, a lot of it is you know, education at the, at the local level and implementation of these technologies mm -hmm. um, at the local level, whether it's you know, reverse osmosis or, or these packets. It's, it's you, you've, you, you know, like with our machines, you get there, and then you got to let somebody else take it yeah. from there. And that's a big, sometimes there's a big disconnect there. Well, and I think it's, it's maybe looking at meeting halfway, right? Because, Sylvia, the, the, the policy reforms that need to happen, I think that includes pricing of water and getting tariffs right so that, that these costs can be recovered by utilities while the poor also get a lifeline amount of water for a reduced rate. And as that comes up from the bottom in terms of yielding more revenue, maybe the technology is being driven, because I know the cost of desalinization has come down dramatically 
uh, over the past decade. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that's part of the solution is that pricing of the technology coming down while this resource base is coming up. So over to you, Luis, and I'll guide my question in terms of innovation a little bit, if you can respond to it, is, uh, and then you can go in whatever direction you want after that, <laughs> but I wanted to take you towards agriculture, right? Because this is one set of the, the issues right over here in terms of municipalities, water for human consumption. But I did some math the other day, and I calculated basically if you could reduce the consumption, if you could increase the efficiency of agricultural irrigation just by 2%, that would free up enough water, and this is a very macro thing, right, because it's all local, but if you looked at it from a macro perspective, that would free up enough water to meet the basic needs of everyone in the world right now who doesn't have access to safe water. So, yeah. So, so uh, what's happening there? Actually, you know, I'm not an expert in agriculture <laughs> inside the company, but we are working on several initiatives with farmers, and, you know, and we work with uh, all sides of farmers, and mostly for several of the crops in the third world, and what we, percentage of your business is food? I should, you know, Pepsi, buy, we all think of Pepsi as, as, as a cola, it, it, but what it's, percentage It's about the, the same size between, let's say, okay. the, the, the three legs so of the business. So you're a huge player it, it, in We're a huge markets. player on the, on the food size, and, and we work with from uh, oats to potatoes and corn, et cetera, uh, as raw material. So we work with farmers of all sizes, and mostly in the, uh, in the develop, uh, developing world, we work with small farmers. So actually, we're engaged in activities from education with them, activities to teach them and, and work with them on irrigation. For example, we're growing potatoes with a drip irrigation in Mongolia. We're working with the, uh, the Earth Institute, and, and, no, with, the, with Cambridge, actually, you know, in, in, in drip irrigation for certain crops to go directly to the root of the, uh, of the seed to reduce the need of water. In India, for example, they used to, uh, to grow rice, they used to flood the, the land. Today we're using different techniques, which is direct rice seeding, which actually you know, reduces dramatically, dramatically the need of water and labor to, 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 grow, to, to, to grow rice. So there's a lot of initiatives going on on, on, on that front. And, you know, and to the earlier point, I think you know, technology is, is innovation and technology is one of the parts of the uh, solution. The other part is in processes as well, in our internal processes in beverage, for example, we used to rinse bottles with water before being filled. Today we do it with purified air, and we're moving to install that. So there's a lot of reductions, even in the, in, in the food industry for the Walker's crisps that they sell here in the UK. You know, we're extracting the water from the potato mm -hmm. and using that water also in the process, and the objective is to be self-sufficient. There's needs for innovation on the social aspect, you know, in an organization like yours, and, Finan microfinancing, how do we deal with that? And policy, I guess, that governments need to innovate and governments need also to, uh, or utility companies, look into their own supply and technology for their own supply because the wastage, you know, I was just in a, in a conference in Rio a couple of years ago, the World Economic Forum, and dealing with authorities of one country which will remain <laughs> nameless, as they, he, he, he was quoting the amount of water that they lost totally lost in the system. It was not about right pricing or wrong pricing. Not unusual, it's 70% is lost. It, it, it was just the amount of water that was not metered, totally, totally lost, so how do we innovate in that? And the other one, which is more long-term, is how do we innovate in education? And not only on, on, on water itself, but in the whole environmental issues. You know, how do we breed or help breeding uh, uh, the, the children, the teachers? To, 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 to make people more aware of these subjects. I usually joke with people and say, you know, I'm an old dinosaur <laughs> getting into this world, but you know, but we cannot afford that to happen to six, seven year old kids. So actually, you know, I, I'm personally in, in, involved in a project that we're working with, with several institutions on getting materials to help the teachers teach about environmental issues, water conservation. And I have the portal now running but to my surprise, there's only 12,000 users and something that is totally free. So actually now I have a challenge, you know, let's say the social entrepreneur inside me is how do I get more people to use a tool that can teach, help kids be aware of all the, all the environment issues so they, when they become our age, actually, they have a leading role in transforming society on, on these things. So Greg, uh, the, the P&G packet, not the pure packet, uh, <laughs> is... <laughs> is it clearly an innovation, 
right? I mean, it's, it's interesting to me. I'm a water engineer, right? And I remember all the way back to the lab that I did with water treatment as an undergrad. Phil Singer. You're basically, <laughs> yeah, Phil Singer, North Carolina. Uh, and it's basically water treatment 101 in a packet, right? You try to find a coagulant that will kind of get the big stuff out and it settles out. And you put in a disinfectant, in this case, is it sodium hypochlorite? Or? Calcium hypochlorite. Okay. Right. Uh, and yet, so that was something that had been around for more than 100 years mm -hmm. as a way to treat water. In fact, you know, almost all of the water that, that we drink uses a lot of that same process. Exactly. But you innovated and put it in a packet, yeah. right? So that's, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. uh, so what other kind of innovations do you see over the horizon uh, that, that P&G might bring to the, to the water space? Thanks, Gary. This is an area I'm really excited about. Uh, the packet itself is, is an amazing innovation. And the guy who developed it is from the UK. Uh, Dr. Phil Suter, and he reverse engineered the municipal water treatment plant into a little packet, and we continue to get recognized for that, and it's great. I mean, today, actually, we're getting, a, later today in Washington, we'll be awarded a, a U.S. Uh, Patents for Humanity Award because of that technology, and, and it's wonderful. I think the next uh, innovation that we, that we need to do uh, as, a, as a water sector is really to build awareness of the global water crisis. You know, we know that in the, de in the developed world, most people don't know that more kids die from diarrhea than from HIV, AIDS, and malaria combined nor do they know about some of the solutions that you've heard here about here today. I firmly believe that if they know the problem and they know that there are solutions, that we can galvanize action. Uh, we've teamed up by hiking Kilimanjaro. Your, mm -hmm. your colleague, Shevany Rivas, and I hiked Kilimanjaro with, with some stars this year to build awareness. We have two other things I'd like to briefly mention. One of them starts, uh, is, is being announced today by P&G, largest consumer products company in the world, and um, the local affiliate of Walmart, ASDA, when people buy a P&G product in ASDA will donate an additional day of clean drinking water using our packets. And we're very excited about this because it's really simple, buy a pack, donate a day of water. And it's a meaningful difference that people can make. Our goal in the first year is to raise an additional 25 million days of, of clean drinking water. Uh, so that's one innovation that's not involving technology, it's a commercial innovation that can help build our business, we hope. We hope more people buy Pampers and Gillette and those products, but also it, it contributes more drinking water. And the other is because to save one life every hour, we're going to need $20 million a year. Uh, we need new funding sources. P&G continues to ramp up where they're giving, but we need sources from outside. And so um, this year at the Clinton Global Initiative, President Clinton announced this work we're doing with Smokey Robinson. He's created a smoke alarm uh, that's a digital emergency broadcast system. Smokey's, you know, he's not the, the biggest user of Twitter and Facebook, but he has mentored everybody, right? So he has now signed up um, people, to celebrities, to donate their Facebook and Twitter feeds, including Elton John, Eva Longoria, Hillary Duff, LMFAO. And so when, when Smokey activates the smoke alarm in the next few weeks, or the next few months, mm -hmm. it'll go out to already 170 million people, asking them to, to donate to help address the clean drinking water crisis. And our Children's Safe Drinking Water Program will receive those funds and then provide it to the groups we work with, like World Vision, Care, Save the Children, and our many other partners. So, weaving together Smokey Robinson, Kilimanjaro, and uh, P&G packets, that's pretty uh, in <laughs> innovative to stitch those three things together. But I think it does, it does speak to the, one of the facets that I mentioned early on is movement building around this. And I think that uh, looking at this crisis through a set of fresh eyes, if we can. And it's hard to do that sometimes because we're so close to it, it you know, especially a lot of us that have been working in the sector for decades, uh, and seeing how embarrassing, in a certain sense, it is that we as a planet haven't been able to get to the solution to this crisis. And why is that? And I think part of that is because we haven't been effective at communicating the messages and building a movement around it. I mean, imagine if we, you know, we've known how to make water safe for more than 100 years. Like you said, you know, you have a treatment plant in a packet, right? Mm -hmm. the, that it's, it's the same technology. It's been around for 100 years. Imagine if, you know, we still had 3.5 million people dying every year from AIDS 100 years after we found the cure, right? So that's it's pretty, pretty amazing that we haven't been better as a sector at kind of messaging this and getting it out. And I think that uh, the Kilimanjaro climb is one thing. I think just to talk a little bit about what water.org is doing on this front, too, with Matt Damon and the toilet strike, if you guys haven't seen the videos it's on fantastic. that. It's fantastic. It's uh, fantastic. You know, trying to kind of come at this a little bit differently with innovation, not just innovation on the downstream, you know, getting things done 
in developing countries, but also kind of in that marketing and the fundraising and advocacy space. So just to pivot back to you for a minute, Phil, I mean, what, what Greg is working on with the, the P&G packet and some of the things that they're doing, uh, it, it's, it's saving lives now, but it's also not the end game. And I think that the technology and some of the things that you're working on, to Greg's point, you know, piped water system and being able to do that. I, I've stolen a little bit of the thunder earlier as we talk about this, but I just want to make sure we haven't missed anything from your perspective about, you know, what are the obstacles as you still see them uh, to getting this done? And, I mean, how much investment do you think you could be placing over the next five to ten years? Well, just in the last probably three or four years, we've put about 20 to 25 million into it. <clears throat> and it's interesting because, like Greg mentioned, our technology is not new. It's not rocket science. We've just taken an existing technology and we've tweaked it. Um, but I think, you know, one of the um, difficulties that we've had, aside from implementation at the local level, is you know, when you go out and you start talking to people about it, uh, the, the cost-benefit analysis is, is strictly mathematical and people have placed, you know, whether it's a penny a liter or a half a penny a liter. And uh, some of the people that I've talked to have talked about, okay, well, I can ship water in cheaper than where you can create it. But I look at it as, well, there's that huge intangible of, and, and I like to think of it as the old adage of give a man a fish, he feeds for a day, versus teach a man a fish, he can, feed, he can eat for a lifetime, where I think you have to find the solution at the local level. Um, and our system, to a certain extent, allows for uh, the people at the local level to have continuity, which I think is very important for um, sustainability of, of some of these different, um, um, for sustainability of, of improving healthcare, healthcare, et cetera. So there, there's, there's you know, any one of a number of, of technologies that, that you can look at as a solution, but the you know, implement, in, in getting the funding is often quite challenging because there's, how, how do you put a number on, as, as you mentioned, uh, saving a life? I mean, is that an extra penny a liter? Or, I mean, it's, but that's how certain people look at it. And at some point, we've got to overcome, um, there has to be kind of that intangible aspect that I don't think people are as focused on when it actually comes down to implementing those, those solutions. And for us in particular, um, we've bumped up against the cost per liter um, versus the, uh, the, the intangible of having continuity and, and being in really control of your own destiny. And how, what bridges that gap, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but you know, that's been one of the difficulties. Aside from you know, we're dealing in um, some of the different third world countries where you have your you know, standard corruption that you're dealing with at the local level. But, you know, again, it's about education um, of what's going on. And it's about almost a little bit of hand-holding that you have to do a lot at the local level because there are, techn there are, there, there are techn technological solutions. It's really, as I think we've all touched on, it's the implementation of these technical solutions are very challenging. And I was having this reflection, you know, I was looking at my own business and how things have evolved. Sometimes I think, you know, we're using old world scorecards for a new world. In, in, in traditional business, you know, it's the, the traditional accounting that we use and the world is changing rapidly around us, which we're still anchored on the traditional accounting methods. And probably in, in this case, what, what, what you brought to mind is are, are we using or we need to develop the right scorecard, a better scorecard to measure all of these efforts? I don't know if it's, I may ask it to you yeah. now <laughs> to be totally unorthodox. But what's your opinion on that, Gary? 
because cost per liter, you know, is 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 obvious. It's an obvious metric, but it, it, is it the right metric if, if we're going to? Because once you measure with the wrong metrics, you're always con condemned as to, yeah. to have the wrong behavior. No, I think that that's a good point, and I think that what how do we measure success in this area? And I mean, the social entrepreneurship is largely about system change, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean. How do you measure system change? I mean, when we work with donors, oftentimes they do want to know how many lives are going to be touched, yeah. how many people are going to get safe water and sanitation. That's a legitimate concern. And so we do continue to use that, that metric. Uh, but we also look at different metrics now. I mean, we look at the amount of commercial capital that we can leverage uh, for every philanthropic mm -hmm. dollar that, that's invested. So with water credit, we have about, uh, so far, put in about $6 million in uh, philanthropic capital that's now leveraged about uh, $14 million in commercial capital to fund loan portfolios so that the, the base of the pyramid is getting access to water and sanitation through loans and commercial capital as opposed to pure charity. So that's a metric that we've been looking at is when we talk to donors now, we talk about the philanthropic cost per person reach, not the total cost per person reach because that's the leverage that the, that the donor can get. So I think that those are the kinds of surrogates that we can start looking at in terms of are we creating system change in this? Are we leveraging the capital that we need to, to bring into this? But thanks for turning the rolls around on me and asking me, <laughs> me the question here. Uh, to so. follow up quickly on yeah. that, another thing that we need to do as a community is to not say water is terribly important only, but to frame it as water is a really important education issue. Water is a gender issue. Girls don't go to school because there are no toilets and there's no water system. Water is an energy issue because you absolutely need water in order to operate those power plants. Water is an agriculture issue. And that might be another way to actually reach a, a different audience that generally has a higher profile in the government portfolio system. I mean, most countries don't even have a ministry of water. but. You know, so that's, that's one way to both potentially deal with the governance and potentially unlocking other types of funds um, that could go into some of the more innovative uh, financing that you've been discussing. Yeah. Absolutely, and I think that, that, that water in, underpins everything and that it, it's kind of a, a whole set of facets within all these other facets, I think, as well. And so, Sylvia, I wanted to, before we go to questions, I wanted to throw it back to you because probably more than any of us here, you at the Global, the Global Threats Fund really zoom up to the very highest level in this in terms of like what, what are the threats to the planet rel relative to water? You know, what, what is the looming threat with climate change? And so I just wanted to give you the opportunity to kind of take us back up to, to a broad level and, and kind of talk a little bit about what, what keeps you guys up at night uh, at the Global Threats Fund. Yeah, climate change is clearly an issue that we're very concerned about. It's one of our five global threats. But uh, I know we've been talking a lot about sort of engineering and technology. Um, and, you know, when you're taught engineering as it relates to water, you always want to know, okay, what's the capacity in which you're building? How much water are you going to have? And how are you going to design that system? And, um, and I know it sounded terribly um, technical, but, you know, water is not that complicated. Water flows downhill unless you put a pump and it goes uphill. I mean, it's really <laughs> not that complicated. But if you start looking at climate change um, and the uncertainty that comes with climate, um, not uh, temperature will rise, but you know, not knowing that it'll be more dry or more wet. Um, obviously, we've been focusing on scarcity, but there's a whole other side of water insecurity, which is f floods um, and the destruction side, destructive side of water. Um, not having um, the information and not be able to design properly from, from an engineering perspective, um, that is a real head scratcher. And so one of the things that we're really finding is the whole water space, um, the UN report in 2009 for the World Water <laughs> Report, it said that we know less about water today than a decade ago. We don't know where the water is necessarily, um, and we don't know where it's going. And so with climate, that's just another layer of uncertainty that since the water world um, is definitely dominated by engineers, mm -hmm. is not something we're very well trained to deal with. And so um, obviously we think data and information is a critical piece because without knowing 
the parameter in which the uncertainty lies is very difficult um, to respond to it. Obviously, there are other issues, governance, technological uh, benefits as well, but um, that's one area that we're really, ha we're really focusing on right now. Mm. So you think the world will be better off if they just let us engineers figure it all out and let the politicians follow? Well, <laughs> well we've been on a panel together <laughs> in the past, and I think, um, I think engineers are great, um, but water really is an interdisciplinary issue. We need to start bringing in more social scientists, religious leaders, um, economists, a lot of other people to bring them into the sector because it touches so many facets of society that it really should not, really should not be led by just engineers. I would second that. <laughs> As a person who holds three engineering degrees, I'm with you. <laughs> we need to diversify it. So now in the interest of diversifying, we're gonna open it up to questions. So, yeah, we have one. Uh, Russell Galetti, I'm with Georgetown University where I'm studying international development. Um, thanks very much for what I think is an outstanding panel. And I think Phil was touching on it a little bit uh, with the concept of local implementation. And uh, I think um, to varying degrees, you're asking people in the developing world to assume some amount of risk. Uh, less risk when you're giving them P&G packets because they can see the results and you're not asking much of them. But when you're asking, uh, you know, monocrop subsistence farmers in, say, Afghanistan to change the way they're irrigating their fields and they may not have rice for the next year if the technique goes bad. Um, how have you all seen in, and I think impl implementation at the local level is key to all of this when so much of the water is being used in irrigation um, and so many of the farmers that are irrigating this water are subsistence farmers. Uh, how have you all seen in implementation the concept of uh, getting uh, people in the developing world to ad adopt uh, larger risk appetites for, for what your organizations or organizations that you've seen may be bringing them? You know, we've been working on this project now for the better part of five years, and it's taken us five years to kind of get through the system. We've been, we built a plant, a distribution and assembly plant in Hyderabad, India, probably four years ago. Um, and it, and it, a lot of it is education, but it's about coordination, um, as Sylvia mentioned, with the municipalities and with the governments. Um, but it is probably the most difficult thing you have in solving this problem. Is, and, and that's the $64,000 question. There's no silver bullet, there's no magic. Um, we ultimately partnered with a local authority. Um, you know, as, as you said, I believe you guys were doing finding partners. You know, I think that was one of the things that we ultimately felt uh, we absolutely needed to do because we know the system works. We've had it tested. We have, we've had it checked. Um, you know, there was a real maybe disconnect in terms of, uh, of how we were looking at it versus how they were looking at it. And... Uh, but it, we ended up getting getting a, a local partner, and we've gone through you know many um, uh, iterations of uh, the size of the machine and this and that, and this is what it's used for. And it, it used to need a power source; it now doesn't need a power source. So it was working with these local people to to actually have them define what they needed, because because for me to come in and tell them what they need, it, that doesn't work. And that's what we found out. To build on that point about reducing risk and also about scaling up, you mentioned this, Sylvia, about um, you know, how we need to, how water is, almost can be an orphan in, until we can find how to integrate it. And actually, the secret to us scaling up from a million packets a year to now 120 million um, has something to do with changing from a commercial model to this, this hybrid model we have. But really, it has to do with figuring out how to integrate it into other priorities. And one of those, just to mention one example, is HIV AIDS. So you know, we started look, looking at this because a woman in Kenya came, in, came to me and said, these packets saved my life. And she says, I have HIV AIDS, and people in this area are dying from diarrhea. Then we started looking at, and CDC has done studies now that showed the top cause of death amongst people living with HIV AIDS in Africa is diarrhea from unsafe water and poor hygiene. And so there's a lot of money in HIV AIDS, as there should be, if you take your antiretroviral drugs and you have persistent diarrhea, you cannot properly absorb your antiretroviral drugs. You can provide the PNG packets or things like it, 
for a rounding error in the cost of treating someone with HIV AIDS. Um, and so it reverses that cycle of people dying from, from opportunistic infections, from diarrhea. And it's a big reason that our program is scaled up because we're helping more than a million people living with AIDS have safe drinking water. Thanks. And, and just, Russell, just one more, getting back to the point about the, you know, trying to get people to change and the risk associated with that. I think that is the role of social entrepreneurial NGOs, especially, is to, when we bring ideas or new solutions, to really share that risk and, and help mitigate that risk on the part of partners. And I know that's something that we've had to do with microfinance institutions because they were very queasy about starting a loan into water and sanitation. So we said, we'll do the first loss loan guarantees for this portfolio. We'll help you with the startup cost. That whole kind of uh, smart subsidy and risk sharing, I think, is your, your spot on with making sure that we hold ourselves to that standard. So, yeah. I'm Nader Al-Khatib, the Palestinian director of Friends of Earth Middle East. <clears throat> I thank you for uh, your presentations. I agree on most of what you said. The governance, education is very important. Water is life. But I think water and sanitation should go in parallel. You know, most of the death cases goes because of waterborne diseases. And if there is uh, a source that uh, continuously increasing is the sewage. And 85% of the domestic water in is sewage. And in the future, the only sustainable agriculture should come from reclaimed, treated sewage. So investment should really go uh, at the same level in sanitation. Otherwise, we'll be solving one problem, we'll be, but at the same time, creating a bigger problem. So <clears throat> what do you think? So I couldn't agree more that you know, we, we can't. I mean, in fact, when, when I came into this um, arena, started working on it seriously with, a, with our packet work, a decade ago, um, nobody wanted to talk about water quality. I mean, the first time I met with USAID, they said, hey, we know you're from P&G. We want to talk about hygiene, not water quality. And, and so th we did the studies to show that the impact of changing water quality is just as high as sanitation, hygiene, or water access. But we don't want the pendulum to swing back now and only do water, ac water quality and not do the others. You know, it's, you, need, you need all four. You need you know, hand washing. You, you need latrine sanitation. Uh, and you have to have water to begin with before you can treat it. So I think it's, and obviously on Millennium Development Goals, that's the, that's the place where we're really, really lacking. I, I, I completely agree. In fact, um, I'm also involved in, in that aspect. But the, the key is, is you think of water treatment and you think of sewage treatment, a lot of it has this, you know, infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. Um, y you have to almost um, create these I don't know, I wouldn't call them portable, but local, localized solutions. And uh, I think there's as much technological, there's, there's as much opportunity for technology change in that as there is water right now, quite frankly. But there's, there's um, they do absolutely go hand in hand. Which is why the Gates Foundation is investing in reinventing the toilet. I mean, you know. yeah. Some of the most exciting social, new social entrepreneurs uh, in the space is in sanitation. So uh, some of the results isn't quite there yet, but I think in a couple of years we'll see some very exciting new models on sanitation. Yeah, treating, treating waste as a resource exactly. that can be then converted into a small or medium enterprise or a larger enterprise to try to, again, coming at it from 180 degrees as opposed to seeing this as, as a threat and a problem, but how can you look at it as, as a business opportunity? And I think that's important. I think it's also that you know, working against us is there is, you know, especially in rural areas, much lower demand for access to sanitation than there is for access to water. And that's something that has to be overcome as well. Because as we do try, and I think we all are trying to pivot more as a sector towards demand-driven solutions, uh, it's, it's more challenging than ever to say, yes, we'll support you with the water project, but only if you dig a latrine, too. It starts to get very supply-driven when you come at it from that perspective. But the more we can be demand-responsive with it and work with like community-led total sanitation programs to bring that awareness up and the social marketing to create the demand, then I think we can make sure that we approach them in tandem. I'm Lisa Nash, Blue Planet Network, and thank you all very much for really sharing the complexity of the issue. My question is really for Greg and Luis. 
and you've both done promotional efforts supporting water, and you've talked about how innovation and water is so critical to your businesses. Mm -hmm. Have you talked as a company about how to really in, infuse it into your brand? Because you are both global companies with cu customers all around the world. And water affects everyone in human stories. And it's all about innovation. And you could really own that platform. So wondering what discussions may have happened above and beyond promotion. It's a great point. And so all of our brands, of course, have a lot to do with water. And we're the largest beauty care company in the world. And so much of our beauty care technology is you know, washing your hair and you use water or it's moisturizing your skin, making sure water where it need, is need to be. That's why our, our P&G beauty brands, now many of them are getting behind our Children's Safe Drinking Water program. Pantene has a program called Healthy Hair for Healthy Water. Uh, SK2, our skin cream, has one in, in Asia. Um, and this, this program that we're going to do with ASDA or Walmart here in the UK is all about that. P&G brands contributing water when you, when you buy them. Um, so I, I think we see the opportunity. And I think you'll see us doing more and more of that in the future. At least I, I certainly hope so. Yeah. I think we're going in the uh, in, in the same direction. We're the second largest foods and beverage company in 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 in, in the world, and este, so actually it's incorporated more into in, into the commercial side. But but actually not not losing perspective that this is not only a commercial effort, a commercial driven effort. This is this is a much larger larger issue than than, than a commercial one. Hi, I'm Susan Chapman from SBC Global Advisors, and. <clears throat> this question is for Phil. So I was surprised and pleased to see you on the panel just because I obviously don't know enough about your investments. And what I do know is that you're known to be a commercial investor, not double bottom line, and that you are willing to take risks in new technologies for the long term, some that face some difficulties. <clears throat> we won't go into that. And so I was curious about the balance between patient capital and return on investment. And I'm sure that you did your analysis and you saw some tremendous upside. Um, and although you're a person, um, it sounds like you'd like to change the world. I know you seek return and you have encountered these difficulties. Were you targeting a particular segment, the industrial, the agricultural? What did you perceive as the upside? And surely in your analysis, you knew that municipalities are not the easiest and most enlightened stakeholders. It's interesting because, yes, we do target a certain rate of return. Um, but many of my investments, I envision certain things from the top-down perspective. And it's, you know, then it, looking at where I've invested, whether it's iron ore or wireless spectrum. Um, and then what I've tried to do is take it a step further and, and focus on a particular area and which is one of the reasons why with this water project, we've focused on India. Um, but before that, it was, I've always been intrigued with water. And, you know, interestingly enough, my father was superintendent of the local water utilities. So it's, for some reason, I don't know if it's Freudian or something, but I've, I've been thinking about it for an awful... I was going to say, you know ice very well. Yeah. <laughs> um, but... Yeah, we do, and, and it, it, it does make it very challenging. You have to have patient capital. Um, you have to have, uh, you have to deal with volatility, and that's one of the problems. I mean, you hit the nail on the head. Bringing private enterprise into this, it's very difficult to look at the end game and say, here's our ROI based on this certain cost benefit analysis or certain cost analysis. So a lot of it is, while I do expect, I, I mean, I do expect to, to make money from this venture, a lot of it is, you know what? I think it's, I think it's a good thing. Um, I know that it helps people. And I think one of the <laughs> most interesting points was when we first started building this plant in Hyderabad, India, I went to the facility and then I went back four months later, five months later, after it was built and we had this tank up, and you saw the little kids out there with water jugs. And you, you know, you can't put a, for me, I couldn't put a price on that. So yes, I do expect to make money. Um, and obviously the more from an investment perspective, the more money you can make, the better. But also too, in this particular thing, there's so much social and 
there's the social dynamic around it. It is almost something. A lot of this is my own capital, um, where it's tough to go to an investor. It's too early stage for me right now to really take it to a, a group of investors and say, this is what I think I'll make. So you do have to almost incorporate um, in entrepreneurialism and uh, philanthropy almost at the same time when looking at these projects initially. So I think you know one of the things is bridging those two that yes, this is an investment, but two, it's also phil philanthropy at the same time. Hi, my name is uh, Rob Hope from Oxford University. Um, I had a quick observation, if I may, and then a question for Greg. The observation was directed to Sylvia's comments, which I'd agree that framing these issues as water diversity is highly misleading. Um, we're facing increasing hydroclimatic risks where droughts and extreme flood events are the, are the major, major challenges that society will face as we go forward. So framing it just as scarcity is not going to be a helpful way to go forward. It's the tail of the distribution. And scarcity in many ways is much easier to plan and manage for than large-scale drought uh, flood events. The question was to Greg. I'm very interested in the PNG packet. And the question was related to how are you working with governments to ensure that these interventions are maintained over time and they're not just a short-term solution? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, we hope the PNG packets are a short-term solution and that people have pipe-treated infrastructure. Uh, but one of the, the ways that um, we found to scale up the approach of not just our technology but other similar technologies, um, we had to create um, a network, uh, much like the Skoll Entrepreneurs Network. We created a network. Uh, of people who are working in household water treatment. It has a secretariat uh, shared by WHO and UNICEF uh, and also the University of North Carolina. And, and one of the major things that group does is work with, with governments and, and share the best approaches. And th only through governments can we have access to schools to teach kids about you know, the, the new um, methods to treat your water and clinics and other ways that we know are critical to diffuse the technologies. Um, so that's, that's, that's one of the major ways. And, and we've seen whenever we've done that, we've had great receptivity from, from local governments. UNICEF usually plays a really big lead role in working with the governments, but particularly governments that don't have as much capacity to help um, a water sanitation hygiene committee take that work forward and begin writing it into their national policy. Rwanda's done a great job with that, for example, as a, as a leader. Hi, Amy Chen with PepsiCo. Uh, thanks for all your comments. Greg, another question for you. I'm wondering if you could take us back a couple years to the point where you realized the P&G packets were not commercially viable and talk about the process by which you sold that into the organization and were able to gain management support for continuing it as an NGO. So that's a great story if you want to hear it. <laughs> I'll make it short. Um, but it, it was, uh, you know, we've been around for 175 years to do something as dramatic as, um, you know, create a not-for-profit within a for-profit group, never been done before at P&G. And so uh, I call it uh, corporate antibodies came out against a new idea like this. Particularly, I'm an R&D guy, not a marketer by, by, um, by training. And so um, we reversed the commercial decision because actually the, at one point the company decided to stop the program uh, for a very short time, and, and we overturned that decision. I had to go to the CEO, and um, before I went to the CEO, I went to the vice chair. And I was with the vice chair and the head of our external relations function, and he basically said, I think you're going to fail because we failed with a team of 20 people, but water is important to our company, and it's not, you're not asking for a lot, so go ahead. We met with the CEO, with our head of external relations, myself. Um, she did a really interesting thing. She made sure that we had completely addressed the issue by over-exaggerating his concerns. She said, the vice chair thinks this is a turkey of a product. And I'm like, wow, what did she do, change? You know, now she's against this, she's throwing me under the bus? And then she turned it over. I, was about to, I could tell she was about to have me say whatever I wanted to the CEO. And I used to carry pictures. And I took a picture of that woman whose water was stolen. And I was going to give it to the CEO. But right before, and I got ahead of myself, right before I handed the picture to her, she said, so what it comes down to is you either believe the vice chair or you believe Greg. And I was startled. I was like, oh, my God. And, and I ended up throwing the picture in the CEO's lap. And so, <laughs> and so then I had to decide, do I admit I'm, like, scared to death? I went for acting like it's an act of bravado. I'm so confident that I'm going to throw this picture in your lap. <laughs> and so then I told him the story of the woman whose water was stolen, so from the emotional level. Then I explained the logical level of how when P&G is invested to reach these rural communities, far rural communities that need the packets, it's a, return on, it's a loss on investment. But if we team up with World Vision and PSI and Care and Save the Children, they're already there. And we've already begun to see that they see it as an important tool. We then later learned how to integrate it. 
And the CEO said, we're asking for approval to go into two countries, Hay and Uganda. And he said, well, how many countries are like this? And I said, well, we started at the time. UNICEF had the top 40 for, for deaths from diarrhea. I'd say, well, there's 40. And he goes, well, I want you to think of the 20-year plan. The CEO saying, think of a 20-year plan, right? And, and it was, to me, as an entrepreneur, it was a great leadership lesson. The, the external relations officer laid it all out. So you, you know the CEO and the vice chair were going to meet later in the hall and talk about this. And as companies, or organizations, things, you know, it's hard to make a final decision. But he would hear, the CEO and the vice chair would know that that address was concerned, was, that concern was addressed. Um, and then the CEO's lesson was a really good one. The vice chair said yes. He gave me the exact same amount of budget that the CEO did. They, they gave me the same, they both said yes, they both gave me the same amount of money, but when I left the vice chair's office, I thought I was going to fail. When I left the CEO's office, I'm like walking on air, I got the 20-year plan. So um, some, some really good lessons. And, and about a month and a half after we made that decision, the, the Southeast Asia tsunami hit. And P&G was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal with our, our efforts with others to help address the, the, uh, the crisis there that, where water was such a good need. And that sort of, forgetting the bad pun, but that sort of washed away the bad feelings about creating this as a not-for-profit within, within P&G. Thanks for enduring my story. <laughs> I'm uh, Michael Thornton. I'm an MBA student here at the school. Um, before that, I was a civil engineer. So a, a question, I guess, about the, the looking towards the future of water. Um, uh, right now in the, in the U.S., uh, one of the largest power consumers is moving and treating water around, and then one of the largest uses of water is producing power. So I'm wondering um, if you guys could kind of reflect on where you see the future of water, both in the developed world and maybe in the developing world. Is it the same as, as what we've kind of got so far, or is it something a little bit different? I think certain places, I think in the U.S., for example, the whole water energy nexus is really coming together whereas some other places is still quite uh, uh, far apart. Actually, Carl Ganter, sitting right there, um, has just done, has been doing um, this choke point uh, series, first in the US, then in China, then in India, and they're planning to roll out around the world that really looks at the, uh, the water, food, energy nexus. So actually, he's going to be much better at sort of diving deeper in the details. but. Um, but certainly, yes, I mean, in some places, the vast majority of the energy use is just to move water around. And so longer term is this, the idea of collecting all the water and treating it all in the same place, going hundreds of miles away, and then bringing water in from the hills from hundreds of miles away, like in California, moving it down to Southern California, is that still a model that makes sense? or is the more sort of distributed system, both in terms of water treatment and wastewater treatment, might be the way to go. And that might make sense more for developing countries um, for various reasons, but one of which is the le uh, less reliable energy uh, uh, on a regular basis. So I think the whole community is sl slowly shifting towards a more distributed system um, for both uh, water and wastewater treatment. Yeah, I think in terms of movement building too, to try to help people bridge this gap, I mean, people know about the carbon footprint you know, of the planet, and people are starting to know more about the water footprint, but they don't understand how huge the carbon footprint is within the water footprint uh, of the planet. And I think that's another good angle that we could start tackling to let people know that, yeah, you may live in a place that's water rich, so you think I, I don't have to conserve as much, yeah until you start thinking about no matter where you live, there's a huge carbon cost of getting that water treated. And, 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 and desalination yeah. might, would be one of the ones that we need to really look at. Yes, it, mm -hmm. it, it addresses water issues, but what does that do to the carbon? So we need to think of, ideally, a low water, low carbon mm -hmm. <laughs> solution. Conversely, when, when people aren't cutting down trees to boil their water to improve their quality, Mm -hmm. There's a carbon benefit, and and luckily now the some of the house of water treatment technologies are starting to to use carbon credits to finance mm -hmm. their projects, which I think is a, a very innovative approach. So Vestergaard Franson has, has done this, and now some others are, are following behind them. So. When I think of you know the U.S. specific, I think what you will ultimately see is a bigger distribution network, as you mentioned. You know, you look at the oil and gas business. How do you get oil from certain parts of the country to other parts of the country? You pipe it. You know, you're going to have to find 
a distribution network that is that, that solves a part of the problem, um, and you know you may may get uh, pushback on the expense, but. Uh, I, I, again, are, are we in, we could be in a different world, a different accounting um, era, where you have to kind of think a little bit differently, and you know, especially in the United States when the economy is apparently so down, maybe people there should be government projects of building water distribution networks, one massive pipeline to California or Nevada or somewhere. But I think that's how we're going to have to think about it. Thank you to the members of the panel for sharing such fantastic insights. Um, my name is Bani Banerjee. I'm from Stanford. And I had something called Change Labs. And one of our projects is called 100 liter, the 100 liter water project, where we are trying to look at um, how do you ensure at least 100 liters of water to extremely distributed communities in water stressed and water scarce regions. And, and essentially, one thing that we are running into is the obvious equation that the per capita distribution mile in extremely distributed communities creates uh, a real impediment for standard models of, of uh, cost and pricing and, and distribution costs for being viable, as is evident in the fact that in, in countries like India, which has enjoyed uh, fairly high GDP growths, uh, but the fact that you have a high correlation between the social and economic stratification being is correlated to the degree to which the communities are distributed in the poor communities. You see uh, piped water in, in rich communities and women walking for five kilometers with water on their heads, and that has been the tradition for generations. So the question that I have is, is what are, like, and, um, to this is for the entire crowd, but also particularly directed to um, to, to Greg. Um, is I'd rather learn from your uh, successes and your failures as well. Okay. I'm looking for principles and and techniques by which one can reach the last mile. How can we do the cell phone of water? How can we get people way in the interior? Uh, and create a system of very distributed infrastructure? What we did, and, and I won't pretend it's in any kind of the answer, but it's, it's trying to figure out who's already going there and making sure they do the most efficient things that you, know, that you can. So it's the same thing with you know, the health care sector now, that we need more innovations, but more than a new vaccine or new technology, most things that are going to reach rural communities are going through the same clinic or the same community health volunteer. So that's the bottleneck for things. And so you have to make sure that um, it's, that is the most efficient that it can be. So whoever is going to those far remote last mile that you, you want to reach, how can you help them do their job better? So for us, an example is malnourished kids right now in West Africa, right? Um, the standard of care for a malnourished kid, a severely malnourished kid, is plumpy nut or something like it, a ready to eat food. Um, what we found is that if they're in these areas with really unsafe drinking water, um, they have persistent diarrhea. And so even if you give them the plumpy nut, there's a still a good chance they're going to die. But if you can give them safe drinking water along with nutrition, there's a good chance they're going to get better and get better faster. And we've measured that recently in, in Pakistan with one of our researchers. So. A day of clean drinking water is 40 times less expensive than a day of, of ready-to-eat food. So it's making what they're doing more clinically and more cost-effective so groups want to do it. Groups like World Vision and UNICEF or others are responding with more than 350 million liters of clean drinking water along with the ready-to-eat food and for the West African famine and drought. Just, just quickly on that, though, I think you've hit on a really, really challenging issue that needs to be addressed, and that is that in the, in the rural area, you have so many things lining against people there because the poverty is there, the distance is there. And, and it's, it's really hard to imagine how to solve that issue. I think one of the things to look at is, you know, water where it is in situ, the more you can tap into that in terms of groundwater, uh, I think the better because not, well, not only is it you don't have to move it, if you can tap it where you are, 
but uh, also it tends to be clean, especially in rural areas where it's not been contaminated. To flip, so, to flip this on its head, if you're going to go that far, should you only go with water? Right? If you're going to invest to go that far, maybe the project isn't just a water project, but it's really a developmental project where you're building more schools, you're improving the clinics, you're providing water, and, and it's a whole developmental approach. And you do that community. You may not do five of them. You may do that one. But maybe that's the better question. Which at the end implies community leadership as well, mm -hmm. and education, and, and how do you bring the community together? If I may, I have a counterpoint to the, the groundwater comment. Uh, I, my family lives in India, and every time I go back, uh, I, I uh, jump into auto rickshaws and give them a fictitious address so I can do ethnography on the, on, on the person and I can ask them about what's happening in their village because a, a lot of these are migrant uh, people who've come into the, in, into the cities and I can probe into what's happening in the different regions. And I've been doing this for over 15 years now and it's really alarming the rate at which the groundwater is dropping. And so, and it's, it's even more frightening as to how uh, on the surface everything is green and they're growing extremely water intensive crops. And at a time when, when the recharge rate is far, far below the withdrawal rate. And so I'm wondering if, if anyone has come across, and, and I'm developing technology myself, but, but I'd much rather leverage things that have all, already been done on things that really accelerate catchment and storage. Um, because we do, at least in a place like India, you have the monsoon. Uh, but because of the deforestation upstream, a lot of the perennial water sources can go subsoil and it creates a real stress. We're doing a lot of uh, yeah. harvesting of rainwater, yeah. a lot of initiatives in different countries of the world, in India and Mexico, etc. And again, you know, it's not massive, but it's proving to be, uh, to be successful. Yeah, and I think, and again, you know, we start off early on by talking about how local everything is. I think if you juxtapose rural Africa with India, you know, Ethiopia is known as the water tower of Africa. And yet you have people who for generations have been walking, you know, five or six hours a day to get water when literally 30, 30 meters below their feet is all the safe water they could ever want to drink. And so you, you're absolutely right about India and what's happening there. But then for other segments of, this, of the problem, there are those groundwater solutions. So, so there's some questions way in the back. Patrick Moriarty from International Water and Sanitation Center, IRC. I think, uh, thanks. I mean, I think it's been great. And it's particularly, it was nice to hear water governance coming up as being a, a key area we need innovation and we do a lot of work there. But I think, you know, if there's one area of work and of, of advocacy that we're involved in at the moment in IRC, it's in, it's in trying to push the shift from seeing water as projects or water as infrastructure to water as services. And it really, you know, when, when Greg's talking about 20 million days of water, that really resonates for us because that's also how we're trying to get all of us to begin thinking of water. It's, you know, not necessarily days, but person years or, and we know that it's costing, you know, we've done a lot of work on, on research into what it costs to provide water, and we reckon that, you know, for somewhere between 5 and $25 per person per year, that's what it costs to get the most basic level of safe water to, to people. But, you know, that's, that's 5 to $25 every year forever. And what I'd like, you know, the question, I guess, I'm, to, to the panelists, because it's what we're coming up against now, is how do you finance that? Where is that? What do we need to do to finance, to get finance into this? Because, you know, as Greg's been saying, it's trivial. That 5 to $20 per person per year is absolutely trivial when you put it against what people pay for mobile phones, what people, what health costs are, and yet at the same time, we see that systematically it's not been made available. It doesn't, that money, it's not getting there through government, it's not getting there through private investment, and often people aren't prepared to pay it themselves, or they're not prepared to prioritize so how do we, what do we need to do to address that challenge? Is it about cross-subsidy? Is it about lobbying more to national government? Thoughts? I think the good news is that the people at the base of the pyramid, even the poorest, are already paying far more than that yeah. a year to get their water. The good news is that depending on what kind of framework you look at, Roughly, the, the, the rule of thumb is people should be able to pay about 7% of their income for their water services. 
Uh, so if you just look at it from the, this macroeconomic perspective and kind of what's happening at the household level, that money is already in the system. And that money and far more is in the system than what you need to kind of make that $5 to $25 per person. That's the good news. The, the challenging part behind that is how do you get governments and utilities to build a viable tariff structure so that the poorest are getting a cross subsidy for that, that first amount and that so people that are you know, filling the swimming pools in the middle class and upper class neighborhoods are paying more on a per liter basis. That is the crux in my opinion is how do you get that to happen? And I think one of the ways you get that to happen is by catalyzing more kind of accountability and transparency from the bottom up, helping the poor find their voice in the context of their water and sanitation services in the same way that the, they found their voice in the Arab Spring, for instance, in terms of democratization. And so I think that this speaks back to the movement building. This has to be a movement not just within the donor countries and people you know, like all of us who want to get behind this, but it has to be catalyzing a movement from the bottom up in the developing world so that people can exercise their opinions and their rights as citizens to make this happen, to force that policy change. I think there's only so much us international NGOs can do from the top down in terms of trying to change those policies. I think it's going to have to come from the bottom up. So that's my opinion. But I, I particularly think, um, I, I agree with, with what you said. I think an alternative is, you know, the private investment will, I think, ultimately come. The private marketplace will, will at some point be there just like it was for um, cell phones, for mobility. Um, again, you know, creating the solution at the local level via microfinance and entrepreneurship, I think you've seen that model succeed in many other aspects, and there's no reason why that can't succeed with a local water source, whether it's a groundwater, a, a, a well, or whatever technology. But you know, there's, there's all this, diff the difficulty again is implementation and education. But I think there are opportunities at the local level to, uh, to solve the problem. Hi, my name is Grace and I work with a media organization called Good. We've actually featured a few of the organizations here and we have a lot of respect for the work that you do. We also get asked on our strategy side of the business to advise corporations and foundations on how you do build that movement, right? Whether it's a six week campaign or a model for collective impact. And I guess one of the challenges and frustrations that we experience is this tension between wanting to captivate the imagination of the public within a six week or four week campaign campaign period, but understanding that a movement takes a couple of years, so I'm curious to get your thoughts on how do you manage the expectations of internal stakeholders so that PNG will continue to invest in whatever program that you have, and how do you um, maintain engagement with your constituents, whether it's the supporters of water.org through a number of years and beyond you know, a single day of action. So I think a campaign can be really important, like the ASDA PNG thing, where it's going to donate additional funds, and you know it's unrealistic to think that you know ASDA is going to turn the their store like they're going to in the, in the next in the next week. You know, all about clean drinking water. They're not going to continue to do that, right? There's other priorities they have, but a campaign can be really useful, almost like a political rally, right? But you have to you have to do things for the long term, and and for me, the way I look at that is is how do we show within the company the total benefits of the program, particularly since this is a not-for-profit effort. I mean, we're, we have to show that the value of the investment is providing total shareholder return. And, and that's a, a constant thing. It's not a, a simple thing to measure, but this new campaign is one of them. If that builds the business, that's a real clear thing. In the US, we have shown that. Um, we, had a, we have a coupon booklet that is in Sunday papers that reaches um, 110 million people. And once a year, we've themed it about water. We did it really good by saying one coupon equals one day of clean drinking water, one additional day of clean drinking water a couple of years ago, um, put a little media support behind it. The week after we did that was the week of the largest sales in PNG's history. 
which shows two things. One, it can build the business and it can provide a return. The other is Americans do care. If you, if you tell them in an effective way about it, they, they, they will respond. Um, but that's not the only way. We show that it, employ, it helps with employee recruiting and retention. Um, it's helped with um, access to governments, um, you know, by, by them being aware of what we're doing. Um, and it's helped with base of the pyramid marketing. So we now have um, groups that started selling, like Living Goods. Uh, Chuck Slaughter is here, and, and you'll hear more about his work. Um, but they started selling the PNG packets. Um, but we found that what they were selling also, what, what they could sell of PNG, other brands, for-profit brands, were valued by very low-income consumers that we didn't initially think we could, would, would buy our products. Women were willing to spend money on our feminine hygiene product always, even though it was more expensive than a local pad because it provided superior protection, particularly for girls in school uh, who were deathly afraid of getting the map of Africa when they, when they stand up. So, um, so, so we found that um, as much as about 50% of their sales and profit can come from P&G for-profit products that allows that group to be more self-sustaining. Well, in our case, you know, it's the key thing has been built credibility, that this is not a, an internal campaign, but it's something there to stay. So actually, this form gets embedded into the culture, you know, and, and actually, you know, has gets so embedded into a culture that, you know, I have certain objectives. Part of my objectives in the years, same as my business objectives, I have what we call performance with purpose objectives tied to my results, my bonus, my compensation, etc. So we just, to the people, it's, it's showing that we're consistent and persistent and it's not yet a one-year fad. It's just a way of, of, of doing business and actually you have to... Uh, Actually, your behavior is what shapes culture at the end. Great, thanks. And we're out of time. So I just wanted to, to just sum up real quickly. Uh, so many good ideas that are shared here, great questions. I think you know, we're hearing a lot about the, the, the need for policy change, for governments to be more engaged. We're hearing a lot about how can we curb the demand? How can we, can we work on uh, the soft path that, uh, that the Pacific Institute talks about, reducing demand? Uh, as opposed to always trying to find more supply. And seeing agriculture as a big place where we can get some wins on that. And then this, this concept of bridging in private capital and how do, we, how do we really get these investments structured so that they can attract that kind of capital, you know, that, that delta that I mentioned before of $191 billion that we need to find each year. Uh, and then I also just want to say that, that this wasn't set up for us to kind of be up here and provide answers and solutions all nicely packaged up, right? That, that's kind of the, the beauty, I think, of, of this conference. It's, it's kind of the beauty of kind of what's coming up in the pipeline of social entrepreneurs as well that are really focused on this. I, I, just in the last week, I had the privilege of speaking to a great group of business school students at the University of Southern California. A few days later, I was speaking to another group at CGI University, at Washington University in St. Louis, and I was blown away by the social entrepreneurs that are in the pipeline that are thinking about these issues and that could have held their own you know, in some of these discussions today. So it's about getting these ideas out there across the spectrum among younger, social entrepreneurs among people here. And the, the concept I really love is that, that no one has a complete idea or a complete thought. We all complete each other's thoughts. And nobody has a solution in a vacuum. It's always built on the ideas and the solutions of people that came forward. I just think the pure packet, right? Something that happened 100 years ago in terms of treating water and treatment plants, the packet was built on the shoulders of that innovation. So I think we should go away from, from this session and from the forum in general looking for those nuggets of ideas that other people presented that then can be combined with your ideas so that full solutions can be built and then developed and distributed. So look for the nuggets that you found today, take them away and incorporate them into your solutions and then maybe we'll talk about them next year. Thank you.